on the future of mobility in Singapore, Marcus Schuster, the managing director of Audi Singapore. Marcus, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. Great to have you with us. Yeah, great to have you with us here. Everybody knows the Audi brand and and um, all the all the wonderful cars you have. Um, let's let's talk about look. I guess the big news has been the COE, right? You know, record pricing on COE, which of course you have nothing to do with uh, in terms of the pricing. But uh, how? What kind of impact is that having on on what you're seeing with with the uh, the cars that you know your customers and, and potential customers? The, the, the topic of COE. COE is always a huge topic in Singapore, right? Uh, very emotional topic, also. Hmm. Uh, I think at the moment uh, it actually shows that there's still a very strong demand for cars, and there's hmm. there's a demand that has been panned up over over the pandemic and people still buying cars so uh it's it's a two-edged sword for us uh, obviously we'd yeah. be happy to have lower coes yeah. um but it also shows the demand so so the it, it, it's a very robust market still yeah yeah we were talking about this off air marcus that yes very robust um but the demand seems to be there and regardless of what happens to the coe numbers in the coming months and years you still see the demand remaining constant and steady particularly for a luxury yeah. car like yeah. audi i'm guessing so so what we've seen over the pandemic is that actually the demand for individual transport has mm. been going up right mm. people were hesitant to take public transport mm. and uh, this is also something we we still see there there is still a demand for uh, individual transport for owning cars in singapore yeah um uh, th there's a clear policy of uh, the government to keep the car park stable that's mm. why the coe system is in place uh, what we see that especially in uncertain times people turn to very strong brands and that's why actually also the share of premium cars luxury uh, cars in singapore has has gone up uh, over the pandemic. Yeah, we we found over the years the, the the topic of the COE has been much talked about and much debated, um, as as ERP and some of the other um, uh, methods that are put in place to to limit the the amount of cars on the roads and yeah. certainly at certain times of day. Um, when you look at that system in Singapore versus uh, what some of our friends have to deal with in KL or Jakarta or Hong Kong or even London, uh, well, just come yeah. London as well, right? Yeah. Um, you know the system well most of us don't necessarily like the extra costs that are added. It has actually led to a more drivable, a more um, uh, transportable uh, community mm. in Singapore than than some of our neighbors nearby, hasn't it? Not? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been, you can even look to, to Europe. I've been living in Germany for a long time in Italy. And uh, also when you compare it to some other big cities, uh, you look at KL, Jakarta, um, you have an excellent infrastructure yeah. here in Singapore and the infrastructure is right sized to the amount of cars. So, mm. so you have a development of the car population and the infrastructure that goes hand in hand. And that's why uh, actually the traffic is just so fluid in Singapore yeah. and uh, you don't have any actual traffic problems in Singapore. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, you also have to see that um, the, the income that the government generates with the COE goes into new investments into public infrastructure, also public transport. Yep. And uh, so, so you have an excellent uh, infrastructure for individual traffic in Singapore, but you also have a really outstanding uh, public infrastructure for public transport and this combination makes singapore i think really outstanding mm -hmm. in the world yeah and money yeah. that also comes of course from the taxes from the sales yeah. of uh, of high-end cars luxury cars like yours at audi and as you mentioned there the sales for luxury high-end cars audi and other brands it does seem still quite robust you know in singapore you, you know you're there day after day why do you think that is i think as i said i think in in uncertain times people tend to go to strong brands right brands they know they they know they can trust and uh, plus mm. also um you have to consider singapore got through the whole pandemic uh really well so there, there were support programs from the government mm. um the, the the rebound that we see at the moment uh is very big a lot of companies coming into singapore because they understood that singapore is an excellent place to make business yeah. and a very reliable place to make business and i think this is all uh, th those are all things that drive the demand for premium mobility mm -hmm. so just to mm -hmm. add to that that element of premium mobility as you call it do you think that there's an element of it being therefore recession proof in a way or cost of living proof in the sense that there'll always be a very small 
group of people that will always afford that kind of car regardless of coe price regardless of erp price regardless of the state of the economy you're always going to have that niche audience that will buy that car no matter what definitely definitely and and singapore is a very wealthy country compared yeah. to other countries so so i think the demand for uh, luxury high-end products in general is very natural to Singapore. Yeah. Have you noticed any trends uh, in recent years as people are a little bit more cost conscious and with products that last for many years beyond their 10-year COE? Yeah. Um, are you seeing more people tending to stay with their cars longer and or opting for the extra five years on the on the COE after yeah, 10 years? Question. Are you seeing any trends like that with Yeah, with that's, that's definitely a, a point that we see at the moment in general in the market. Um, a lot of people holding on to their cars longer also because the COE is so high. Yeah. That obviously on the other hand leads to lower deregistration numbers that's why also the the coe quotas that are issued uh, mm. at the moment are so low it's kind of a self-driving system yeah. there i see and, so and the then, more cars that are leaving the market the the more coe's are which would bring the price down yeah, exactly COE, right? exactly i mean i'm putting you on the spot a bit here but is, is it an element I've, I've read pieces that it could be counterproductive in the sense that one of the reasons for coe is to maintain maintain the numbers of cars on the road but also try to lower carbon emissions where possible where, of course, newer cars generally tend to have a lower carbon emissions anyway because they're just designed better, they're more fuel yeah. efficient and so on. But we don't have as much of a higher turnover of cars because like mine and Glenn, I mean, my car is almost 15 years old. Yeah. If I had the same car in a different country, I know my carbon footprint would be lower because it would be a newer model, newer brand and more fuel efficient. So is there an element of where it's slightly counterproductive where if we continue to maintain older less fuel efficient cars on the road for longer it becomes as i say more counterproductive yeah i i think i think this could be a factor um the i think our responsibility as as producers of cars is then to have a really attractive offer of cars that convinces right. people that it's actually better to get a new car yeah mm. and and i think especially right now the development that we see with the evs in the market yeah. that is very promising because a lot of people coming into the showroom even if they have older cars and actively asking for electric cars um, because they understand that this is the new technology and this is the future proof Absolutely. technology and uh, i think with this there is a lot of incentive there also to change to a new car yeah what yeah. are you seeing in terms of uh, of what you are offering in terms of hybrid and electron uh, electric cars i think the the e-tron is the one that i've, yeah. I've seen recently which yeah. is an unbelievable car what's an uh, e-tron uh, it's, well, why don't you tell us about your, yeah, so, what you're so, offering in the hybrid and electric space? Okay, so, so Audi has a very clear um, strategy in the way that we say uh, we go totally EV, so battery electric vehicles uh, at the so moment. Not we, don't, we don't offer hybrid models okay. um, because uh, we, we think this is just a consequent uh, model to do. Right, yeah. and uh, currently we, we have the the e-tron, which is an SUV. We have the e-tron Sportback, which is a more sporty SUV, and we have the e-tron GT uh, in the market, which is a Gran Turismo model. And then we also have the high-end versions of that. So we have the RS e-tron GT, which is fully electric, uh, from zero to one hundred in three point two seconds. <laughs> so, so this is super sports car numbers that you see in an electric Nought car. To what? Not to 100 in 3? 3. 3.2. Wow. I'd need yeah. that in Senkan. <laughs> but, uh, that, and, that's, yeah, and, and, and if you really wanted to do something special, Marcus, what you would do is build your own lane between here and JB, right? Yeah. An Audi lane. Yeah. So that you could actually do that 3.2, you know. In, oh, we, in... We'd love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do the show from the car. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think, I mean, something we do for our customers in, in our My Audi World customer program mm -hmm. is uh, that we do driveaways and we also do track days, for example, yeah, when sure. we go uh, to Sepang or to some. <laughs> other race circuits where people Brilliant. can actually drive the full potential yeah. of the cars. And, and so in terms of your electric vehicle stable, is has there been any announcement by Audi to go fully electric uh, yeah. through all cars? What, yeah. what does that policy look like? Okay, so uh, Audi will um, eventually completely phase out internal combustion engine wow. cars. Fantastic. Our last um, product launch um, that is internal combustion engine will be in 2025 
and then 2026 onwards all the new launches of cars will be fully electric wow. and we actually plan to phase out uh, internal combustion engine cars from our product line uh, until the beginning of the 2030s wow so so very very clear uh, strategy there uh, which I'm, I'm very happy about because it, it gives us a very clear guideline yeah. and it also shows uh, the public and the consumers that we have a very strong commitment to a really sustainable uh, mobility future. Yeah. Brilliant. You're, go on. I was going to uh, say, uh, just, you're the first yeah. person I can ask this question to. As, as Glenn knows, I recently returned to England for the first time in four years to visit family. I was shocked at the transformation, how rapid yeah. it has been towards electric cars. I was genuinely shocked and slightly embarrassed living in Singapore. I have to say this. Yeah. My sister has an electric car. My brother has an electric mm. car. There are electric charges everywhere mm. in shopping centers, in public car parks, in, in uh, service stations, and so on and so on. And then you come back here and I'm driving this 15 year old car that still has a CD player because it's the only car I can afford. And there's not many charging stations in Singapore. Mm. And then you think, Marcus, surely Singapore could switch from a logistical point of view yeah. easily. Yeah. Charges in every HDB and condo car park service stations and you're almost done because we never drive more than 30, 40 kilometers right. at any one right. time anyway. So the question to you, and I'm putting you on the spot again, are we switching to EV cars fast enough? And, and what more do we need to do in Singapore? Okay, I think Singapore started pretty late with this mm. uh, development. Yeah. Um, but um, as many things in, in Singapore, once the government decides that they want to commit to a certain uh, direction, mm. then uh, there is a very fast pickup mm. up of this. And uh, we, we've seen this with the introduction of, uh, of the incentives and tax incentives uh, for EVs uh, in 2022, that since then the demand for electric cars has really gone through the roof. Really? And, and, uh, and Singapore is the perfect place for electric cars. As, as you said, yeah. people drive 30 kilometers per day so in one week you drive less than you have in one charge so yeah, so exactly. actually also the infrastructure and yeah. uh, problems that you have in other markets where you have range anxiety it's something you don't have in singapore yeah so um yeah. and at, at the moment um we we see an increasing number of charging stations also uh we we believe that we as a supplier we have a responsibility there also so so we have our own audi destination charging network that we are extending mm. right now um where we want to offer um destination charging solutions for our customers in places where they would go to anyways so right. so we have one charger at orchard gateway uh, we have chargers at our service uh, point in ubi and our dealership uh, at uh, alexandra road mm. and uh, we will be extending this uh, audi charging network uh, over the next months and years awesome we're talking with marcus schuster managing director of audi singapore and uh, i had a, a chat with uh, rudy your marketing yeah. uh, guy the other day and and he was mentioning you know the range three easily three to four hundred kilometers yeah. on a charge yeah. and this universal charger uh, charging adapter right that's uh, ubiquitous right. around singapore yeah. seems like uh, again the relatively small amount that everybody drives here, everybody should be in an electric vehicle. Of course. Like, there's no reason not to be, right, for yeah, Singapore. Actually, to, to be honest, yeah. just considering the range, there, yeah. there is no reason. Um, what, what we feel is, and, and what we see with many customers uh, who are coming into the dealership, it's, it's a lot about also educating and informing um, the potential customers for EVs and taking away that psychological block that it could be a problem for them because for most of the people it's no problem most of them will yeah. actually find a, a, a charging uh, station close to where they work mm. for example or when they go to a mall so so it shouldn't be a big problem well uh, ian has actually anticipated what was going to be my next question which is thank you for sending it in ian which is with the boom of evs and exponential growth as demand grows has audi and other ev car manufacturers considered his words the doomsday impact of batteries you know we've read stories yep. about batteries battery waste potentially being dumped 10 or 20 years time whenever uh, because i have read stories about the carbon emissions of battery production right and, and this kind of thing so 
what are we looking at with that with in terms of battery production carbon footprint and how and their shelf life basically yeah. and how long yeah. do they last it's an it's an excellent question because if you look at the whole impact uh, co2 impact of a car it doesn't start when you start driving Correct, the car, of course, but yeah. it starts in the production. Yep. So, so what we are looking at at Audi is to, to look at the whole value chain, and that starts with the production of the batteries, uh, which is still is, is energy intensive. Yep. Um, but uh, for example, our um, plant that we have in uh, in Brussels, where we produce the e-tron, that is already CO2 neutral. Um, at the moment. And regarding the topic of battery recycling, um, it's a huge economic factor also for uh, for car manufacturers because the all the um, the materials that go into producing batteries and uh, they're very expensive. Yes. Mm. So so the OEMs we have uh, our own interest actually at recycling this and and there are uh, already recycling um, and reusing or, or re, um, re, how do you say that? Reutilizing um, concepts for batteries. So what you can do is one thing is you can recycle the batteries. You get all the prime materials out and you use them for new batteries. Um, there are also other solutions where you use batteries, for example, as a backup um, storage um, for electricity. So if you have uh, mm -hmm. solar cells in your house, you might be able to use batteries that were applied in a car before just to use that uh, because to, it's to a store that intensity of use to store that energy. Of yeah. Well, that's really, you know, and I've and I've read a couple of articles in in recent months about just the understanding from the scientific point of view of how to recycle uh, how to make batteries more efficiently, but also how to recycle them more efficiently yeah. is growing with every year that there are more of these in the market. Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. and, and so the, we don't know now, we don't know what we're not yeah. going to know in the future, right? Uh, because it's in your financial interest to make it, it as efficient as you possibly exactly, can. Exactly, exactly. Right? And yeah. it, it's also a topic of, uh, of getting more and more independent for the OEMs um, from the suppliers of the batteries, right? Mm -hmm. if, if we are able to uh, build batteries ourselves, recycle the batteries ourselves, uh, we get more independent. And uh, yeah. especially through the pandemic, uh, we've seen the chip shortage, we've seen um, yeah. there is a strong push in the whole industry to to make those whole production processes more robust and yeah. more independent. Interesting. You mentioned uh, incentives to switch to EVs yeah. in Singapore. Are there any more you would like to see or, or you envisage in the future? I mean, I'll give you an example. When I was with my sister in London, yeah. there are congestion charges in London, which right. are based on the ELP, yeah. by the way. Uh, yeah. the, ELP. the ERP is based yeah. on that. On no, it's ELP. It? London's is based on the ELP. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. I, right. And oh. uh, so they have ELP equivalent congestion charges in London. She doesn't have to pay them because yeah. she has an electric vehicle. She oh. can drive in theory anywhere she likes in any place in the UK that has congestion charges and she doesn't have to pay because yeah. she is not emitting any carbon from her right. car. Right. Are there things like that in the long term that you would like to see in Singapore, further incentives to switch? Yeah, I think it's something we, we've seen in Europe and in other markets that um, the incentives really trigger um, the, the a strong development towards EV. Mm -hmm. So, so the more incentives and the more um, targeted the incentives are, yeah. um, the the bigger is the impact and the faster is development of of EV adoption in mm -hmm. the market. So, mm -hmm. so we are happy to see something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also a very very important role plays the, in the um, investment into uh, charging infrastructure. Yes. and I think there is a very clear. Uh, plan there with the the green plan from from the government here in Singapore and uh, also the the smart mobility plan yeah. to to implement these chargers and uh, that is from our point of view at the moment the biggest concern that people still have yeah right. we're talking with Marcus Schuster the MD of Audi Singapore uh, and Marcus uh, just to kind of to round out this conversation let's let's look to the future let's talk about the future of mobility in singapore yeah. the government wants to go to a car light culture right how do we achieve that how do you as a as a brand head uh who's in who wants to sell cars how do you look at that future uh, of a car light society in in singapore yeah i, I think it's uh for car manufacturers 
uh, it's a very interesting question because we we have to shift our paradigms. We have to shift um, the way we think about making business, we, mm. and we have to become from car providers to mobility providers. Mm. And uh, so, so we actually we we embrace this development that we have in Singapore. Uh, what what we see and what we believe in the future, we will provide more mobility solutions than just selling cars. Yeah. So and so what does we. That look like? So, so at the moment, for example, we already have a program which is called Audi On Demand, where also people who don't want to buy a car or don't can't afford to buy a car still have the possibility to drive an Audi uh, for one hour, two hours, and up to several months that they can just hmm. rent the car. Now that's a fantastic idea. It so in theory, idea. a family wedding or Chinese New Year period or Harry right. Raya. Yeah, you got relatives coming into town. Right. In and out, in and yeah. out. That, so you could do yeah. it. For, that's, that's the future. That's yeah. a terrific yeah. idea. Because in, in, a, in a country where you have such a great public transport infrastructure yeah. also, you might not always need a car. But there are certain instances Absolutely. where you want to have the car, and then we should be able to provide that. And then we should be also be providing really premium luxury uh, experience with that. That's a great, great idea. Well, Glenn and I have to get up for this show early every Saturday. So yeah. if you could give us one from say, what do you think? Eight to 12? Eight to 12 would be, yeah. Eight yeah. to one. Let's just call it yeah, eight, eight to one. To one. <laughs> okay, just to drop us off and pick us up. We're, we're up for that. Yeah. We'll Audi on demand's well. there for you. We want a driver as well. Yeah, absolutely. Don't trust me with an Audi. No, heavens no. Uh, great conversation. Brilliant. Marcus Schuster, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, appreciate your time today. And uh, we'll be looking out for for the uh, the rings, the the logo on on the on the hood of your cars uh, around town, as we say, especially those electric vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. All right, thanks so much for having. Me.